So let's head over to 1 Thessalonians, please. Um, you can surely see it uh, in uh, the creation itself this morning. Hope springs eternal. It's happening before our eyes. And what's happening in uh, nature itself is also uh, happening in our souls. We are wired for hope. And if you've had a bad year, if you've had a bad month, a bad week, uh, there's just something in you that gravitates back toward hope. I want to believe the definition we've been working on is, is that hope is the confident expectation of better days ahead. And uh, we are made for, wired for, uh, this idea of hoping. Now, uh, last time uh, we studied hoping for God's best in our leaders. And today the corollary or the uh, partnering uh, truth, uh, as promised, uh, hoping for God's best in our church. And uh, I watched uh, the Hawks uh, the other night uh, tie up the series. And uh, if you're not a Hawks fan, you won't understand the uh, jubilation in that regard. I see a couple of Hawks jerseys here. I would guess that you're on the other side of that problem. And, and uh, that's awesome. I, I, uh, Duncan Keith had, was out for a few games. And uh, even though these big players, Taves and Kane and so on, um, it was interesting. He came back and uh, played 31 minutes. And I was just reminded as I watched this, and I, I, I know that some of you don't care about this, but there's a point I'm making. It's that it takes a team, more than people see, to win, to really win, to win a championship. It takes a whole team. Um, if that's hard for you to relate to, uh, let me give you an example from the Cubs. <laughs> um, uh, who also have improved their team. Uh, ben Zobrist, who's a, a strong believer. Uh, my daughter's reading he and his wife's book right now. In fact, they, um, I'm told, uh, um, maybe his wife, I think, has attended our cathedral campus a couple of times. It would be wonderful if we got the chance to love and uh, care for them. Um, God knows, but I know this. Um, it takes a team to win. It takes a team to win. Now listen. Hope is a team sport. When I say that you're wired for hope, I'm saying that the inclination is in you from the Lord. But church is supposed to be the place for hope. Weekly attendance is a God-given inoculation against the despair that is crashing upon us in this world. And we need, we desperately need, thank you for uh, showing your conviction in prioritizing what we're working on in this series, which is weekly church attendance. Mark yourself down, three weeks in a row. If you missed one, all right, if you missed one. How many people got three weeks in a row? Come on, let me see. Good for you. Keep it going now. Keep it going. We're going to go 12 weeks. I'm telling you, you'll never again question this conviction if you give yourself to this the way you are. And thank you for that. So um, we're going to talk about the way that we help each other hope. That's what the message is about today. First, come on, let's all pray together. Father, as we take your word in our hands, we bow to say, the messenger is nothing. The people are hungry, though. And we ask that your Holy Spirit would rivet our hearts to this reality that hope is a team sport, that it is something that we have such an incredible capacity to give to one another. So across each of our campuses, in each row, in each family, in each heart, give us a deeper understanding of hope and our part in it. Do it now and do it for your glory in the building up of your church, we ask by faith in Jesus' name, amen. Hey Amen. Well, I thought I was going to give you four things, but I got so excited about the first three that the last one in your notes is going to have to wait till next week. Um, let me start reading here uh, where we left off last time. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. We're going to really pick the message up in verse 12, but the paragraph begins in verse 9. Are you looking at it? For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil, Paul wrote, but the Holy Spirit inspired. These are God's words. We work night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. 
You are witnesses in God also how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you believers. For you know how like a father with his children we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom. Do this for me. Circle there the word walk. Walk. I want to talk now about these things of... um, Yes, hope. Yes, the church is the place of hope. Yes, this is where we come to get our hope renewed. But listen, listen. Not some vague, general, cloudy, unknown sort of sense of hope. No, no, no. Listen. Some really specific things. Here's the first one. Hope for our church to walk worthy of God's kingdom. Do you see there? Do you see it in the text? You should be checking. How we exhorted and encouraged and charged each one of you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom. Is, what I, is, is it coming from the scriptures what I'm saying? This is one of the, the whole books about hope. And, and what we're hoping is, is that what he desired for them that we would desire for and cultivate in one another. If you have a paraphrastic translation, it may have deprived you of the biblical picture here, which is walk. Some translations say live a life, but actually the Holy Spirit uh, didn't just give the concept. He gave the picture that the Christian life is like a walk. Someone say, how's it like a walk? Thank you for asking me that. Number one, a walk is deliberate. Um, I think things I don't want uh, to think. I say things I don't want to say. How many people have ever taken a walk they didn't want to take? Well, maybe, actually, maybe your wife talked you into going for a walk. and, and But walking is deliberate. Even if you did it reluctantly, you had to choose to do it or it wouldn't happen. How many people have ever thought a thought that they truly did not want to think? Right? But you've never taken a walk you didn't want to walk. Walking is deliberate. Walking is daily. I've had days without sleep. I've had days without speech. I've had days without any relational interaction. I've had days without eating. But I've never had a day without walking. Never. Not one day. Walking is deliberate. Walking is daily. Walking is is determined. You set your course, you move your feet, you pick your feet up one after the other. Now listen, the Christian life is like a walk. Uh, Eugene Peterson, now in his 80s, a great pastor in our generation, said that he was actually quoting Nietzsche when he said that the Christian life is a long obedience in the same direction. How long have you been doing this? And you're not done yet. You say, I've fallen. Get up and keep walking. It's a, how many people have felt like it it can get long, right? I'm still following Christ. Yes, you are following in his steps. You're walking. What a beautiful picture. In Romans 6, it says that we walk in newness of life. Romans 8, 4 says we walk not after the flesh. Romans 13, 13 Uh, says that we are to walk honestly. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, walk by faith, not by sight. Galatians 5, 16, walk in the spirit. Ephesians 5, 2, walk in love. Ephesians 5, 8, walk as children of the light. Colossians 4, walk in wisdom. But the number one repeated command relative to walking in the New Testament, walk worthy. Ephesians says it, Colossians says it, 1 Thessalonians says it, and 1 Thessalonians references walking as a picture of the Christian life more than any other book in your Bible. It's a walk, and it's to be a worthy walk. The word worthy has the idea of weight, almost of gravitas. It's when I think of who I am, more importantly, when I think of whose I am, I want to walk in a way that people will be like, oh, well, she's with the Lord. She's with 
God, the one true God. So that's, that's, why she did, that's why he did that, because he's making decisions based upon to whom he belongs. He wants to walk worthy. You don't, listen, listen, worthy. You don't, you don't serve mud pies. If the grandparents come over, you don't serve them mud pies in the basement. Am I right? I'm not trying to vet, vet a problem in my family that has not happened to me. I mean, because people know, you know, the kids play with mud pies maybe in the basement, but you don't serve that to your grandparents. If you, this will help. If you get called to the principal's office, you don't go in your bathing suit. Do you know, do you know, do you know that? This is the kind of helpful stuff I bring to church. I'd like to feel it, I'd like to feel appreciated. You don't, you don't, you wouldn't do that. If your kid got, if you got called from, hey, the school wants us to come, we got to meet with the principal, you know, junior's got some issue. You, you don't go in your bathing suit, am I right or wrong? Put up your hand if you already knew that before you came to church. Right, and if you ever get a chance to meet the president, I've never had the privilege of meeting uh, President Obama, but I, when uh, President Bush was in office, we had uh, met him several times, actually, and it is quite an honor. You'll notice in the picture there that I'm, Wearing a, you will, you will not see that again soon. It's like, what's he wearing a tie for? Tell me why. I mean the president. Now put all those human insignificance, grandparents, principals, presidents, put them over here and think of the inestimable worthiness of God. No wonder he says in the text, notice, notice the threefold, verse 12, we exhorted you, that, that's like, hey, that's what I'm doing actually right now, walk worthy, please, and then we encourage you, that's kind of arm around the shoulder, Come on, come on, let's, let's walk worthy of the Lord. I'm exhorting and encouraging you. But then notice, charged you. Hey, listen up. We're going to walk worthy. So he's, man, he's laying it all out here. We got all three. We've got exhort, encourage, and urge, or emphatically warn is the idea of charging. He's really turning the screws on this. A true believer in Jesus Christ is never indifferent to the need to, for their walk to match their talk. And if you are, you aren't. Aren't what? Aren't a true Christian if you are indifferent to the need for your walk to match whom you say you belong to. Now, much more could be said about that. There's so much power in us hoping together as that community. Because the Bible says that we all fall in many ways and there isn't a single row across our seven campuses this morning moment that doesn't have several people in it who in some regard failed this week. And we see it. And how we see and how we respond to one another in those inevitable moments of, re of revealed unworthiness is so critical to how much progress we mark together. Now, I frequently I use myself as a negative example. It's easier, there's, there's lots to pick from. But I'd like to tell a little story about one time, just one time when I, when I got it right. Can I do that? I'm kind of excited about it. I, one time in a thousand stories, I thought, I thought you'd all be like, oh, here he goes. Really? Really? So when our kids were in high school, 
we lived in Palatine and we would drive down a cul-de-sac and out a street and down another street and then out onto the main roads that would take us to the high school or to the church. And there was this one house. I remember the day I drove by it and the, a big window at the front of the house was boarded up. Maybe somebody threw something from inside. Maybe something hit it from outside. Maybe in a storm, a tree hit it. I don't know how it broke, but it was boarded up. And I thought, well, that's kind of a bummer. And then I saw it a week later, and I thought, man, I bet they want to get that fixed. And I saw it a month later, and I thought, I, I wonder if they want to get that fixed. And I saw it six months later, and I was like, man, when are they going to get that fixed? When they still have that board on there after a year, I went up and knocked on the front door. No, I didn't. I called and dropped by the glass company and gave them the address of the people and paid for the window and said, don't tell them anything about me. And they went over and fixed the window. And as far as I know, they never knew I ever did it. If when we see something that isn't as it should be in another, we are upset about how it affects us. Instead of just the hopeful applying ourselves to the improvement that is needed we stand back and rehearse for all to see and hear our frustration with that deficiency we do great damage to a hopeful community and while we must always hope for God's best in our leaders today we're bringing what the Holy Spirit brought to us through Paul which is hoping for God's best in each other so here here um Make a note of these, uh, hoping when faced with fellow Christian flaws. Anybody ever, come on, uh, honesty in church, how many people have ever observed a fellow Christian flaw? Come on, hands up, don't, don't, come on now. Who's seen, I've seen a flaw in the Christian, I, I saw one. Did you, did you, did you, come on, did you? What you do, listen, listen, what you do in that moment is really important. Do this. Number one, here's four things. See them in process. God's not finished with anybody yet. Philippians 1, 6 says that he who began a good work in you will perform or continue it until the day of Jesus Christ. That's when Christ comes back. Here's a softball question. Has Jesus, has Jesus Christ come back yet? No. This would be a seriously bummer service if we were all here. <laughs> and he had returned, right? Amen? <laughs> Amen. So come on now, lift up your voice. Has he come back yet? So is he finished with us yet? No. So when we see something unworthy in a brother or sister, the closer they are, the more it hurts. What do we do? Well, we see them in process because he who began a good work, he's not finished yet. What's worse than the guy who shows up when you're in the middle of painting the bedroom, repairing the siding, cutting the grass? He's like, you missed a spot. You're like, I'm not done yet. But don't we do that to each other? Here's the second thing. Cover for them. Cover for them. Did you write that down? Cover for them. All right. Now cross out four. Don't cover for them. We don't cover for anybody. That's a bad decision. Proverbs says that he who covers his sin will not prosper. We don't cover for them. We do what the Bible says to do, which is, for example, in Proverbs 10, 12, in Proverbs 17, 9, in 1 Peter 4, 8. Let me read Proverbs 17, 9. It tells us that we actually should, in that sense, cover for one another. Proverbs 17, 9 says... Whoever covers an offense seeks love. But he who repeats a matter separates close friends. So there's something very, very critical in the life of the church. And that is when I know that my brother has, when I know that my sister has revealed uh, an unworthiness, a, a, a not walking worthy, I don't, want, I don't want you to see it. I want to protect and care for them. Now when I'm talking to them, I'm like, we got to work on this. 
So we don't cover for them, but we cover them. We keep the, the people that need to know to a minimum. As the scripture says, there's three times I'll give you three references where the Bible says that love covers. If my, if my son uh, struggles, if my sister falls, if my friend uh, fumbles somehow, I want to help them get up. And I don't want you to think poorly of them. And so grace calls me and love commands me to cover that because love believes the best. And love sees people in process. This is so essential. Then this, give mercy. Give mercy. Grace is getting what you don't deserve Mercy is not getting what you do deserve. What do we deserve? Come on, church, what do we deserve? We deserve hell. That's what we deserve. Good morning. Welcome to Harvest Bible Chapel. You deserve hell. All right? So I know you well enough to know that you come to church to hear truth. You don't need some silly pep talk. Here's reality. Here's scripture. And I love you for this. You deserve hell. But God, who is rich in mercy, demonstrated his love toward us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Right? So if we who are rich in mercy, we deserve mercy, James 2.13 says, check this, James 2.13 says, judgment is without mercy to the one who shows no mercy. Boy, if that doesn't wake you up in the night, you don't understand what it's saying. It's saying that As Jesus said, the same measure that you use is going to be used on you. And I believe that I've actually experienced that reality in my life, both negatively and positively. The measure that you use, the mercy that you give, that's the way it's going to be given back to you. Judgment is without mercy to the one who shows no mercy. And then James 2.13 finishes, mercy triumphs over judgment. Say amen. Amen. No, no, wait, wait, I'm going to give you a run at it. Mercy triumphs over judgment. That's truth right there. So plot your course for the week ahead as it relates to an employee or a fellow worker or a family member. You want to win. I know you want to win. Now I'm telling you how to win. Mercy triumphs over judgment. That is an awesome truth in a hopeful community. And then this. See them in process, cover uh, them, not for, cover them, give mercy, self-examine, self-examine. Galatians 6, 1 says, brothers, if a man is overtaken in a fault, if a worthy walker falls, and we all do, If someone is overtaken in a fault, you who are spiritual, not fallen in the moment, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Here it is. Considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Consider yourself. In other words, when I see a fellow believer, especially in this hopeful community, when I see them fall, when I see them fumble, I, yes, see them in process, cover them with love, give them mercy, but I get a mirror. That's the time to look at yourself. Hard week this week. Um, A dear friend of mine, not a pastor in our church, not a pastor in our fellowship, but a dear friend of mine, I mean, out of nowhere, it came out this week that he had fallen in a way that he can't continue to be a pastor. And uh, I'm not sharing his name because if you don't know his name, then love covers, right? And I want to be super merciful. And you should know that behind the scenes in ways that I'll never speak about again after this moment, but our church is, is doing some things to be helpful. You should know that your church doesn't shrink back and say, oh, what about them? Your church rushes in and says, how can we help? And um, I'm thankful for biblical soul care. I'm thankful for a church that wants uh, to give mercy. But 
I could probably count um, on one hand the number of times that I've put tears on my wife's shoulder. And uh, this was a week like that. And I've been doing what I think we all do, should do, what the, Bible, the scripture commands us to do. When you see someone fall, get a mirror and self-examine. And uh, I'll tell you at the end of the message some of the things that I have already profited from. But I want you to feel the power of a hopeful community. And you are that. And it's having an impact. And if you're not part of that hoping and believing and praying and giving mercy and lovingly covering and self-examining, if you're not doing that, I want you to know that a lot of other people around you are. And I want you to come into the center of that and know the joy of God's forming influence in our life through the power of us hoping in one another. It's what it's all about, and that's why he says, walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. And part of the worthy walking is walking like this when we see those struggling with that worthiness. Well, here's the second thing. Hear receptively God's word. Uh, notice it uh, right here in the text where it says, um, verse 13, we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. That phrase there, um, for this, means literally because of this thing, this thing, this thing you do, and, and you guys do it. So um, what he's really saying in that verse is, is that foundational to any hopeful Christian community is how they receive the word of God. So this is uh, pretty unique. Right now, we're going we're gonna to talk right now about what's happening right now. And this thing that's happening where a messenger is standing up and opening the word of God and it's going out. Um, I said to someone this week, um, I, I would, it wouldn't matter to me if I never preached anywhere ever again except to preach to this church, to these people. Because you are, uh, preachers come to this church, they just can't believe it. They cannot believe the way you come on every one of our campuses. You come to church, you bring your Bible, you take out your pen, you listen for God to say something to you, you write it down. And if you're not doing that, you're in a room full of people that are doing that and are setting a great example for you. That this isn't an exercise in allowing someone's voice into your ear. This is an exercise in letting the messenger become small and leaning in past that to try to hear God himself speaking to my life through his word. And the Thessalonians were like that. Can you think of a better compliment for a church family than you treated God's word for what it is? God's word? I talked to a guy in this aisle uh, last weekend at church, and I said, how long have you been coming to Harvest? He said, well, about, uh, about a month. I said, how long have you been looking? He said, a long time. I said, how did you decide to start coming here? He said, well, we would go to a church, and we would sit in the parking lot, and we'd just watch the people going in. And if they weren't taking their Bibles, we didn't even bother. We just went on to a new one. I was like, Awesome. <laughs> if they don't need their Bible inside, why would we go in? I love that, and I love that about you, and I love that he did that, and, and that that's the impression you're giving, even some of you with your ridiculous electronic Bibles <laughs> who can't share in the joy of this story. Maybe, <laughs> I'm completely kidding, this is just an old person who's bitter <laughs> talking. 
and you, you hold that right up, that's fine, whatever that is. I just thought, thank you, uh, God, that you have been growing that in us. Every year, uh, the phone rings, and it's someone from Outreach Magazine who talks to one of our staff and says, you know, would you allow us to list your church this year uh, in the you know, top 100, top 50, top 25 churches in America by attendance? And I think probably four or five years ago, we started saying, uh, no, no, we don't uh, want to be a part of that list. In fact, I got my friend, Jack Graham, Greg Glory, I got a whole bunch of my friends to say, no, we don't want to be part of that. And do you know why? Because the strength of a hopeful community is not in any way related to how many people are in the chairs. It really has nothing to do with that. And to keep counting and posting, first of all, it, it, it minimizes and shrinks faithful pastors who are in smaller churches numerically, and it, it, it seems to entirely value the wrong thing. I hate the term megachurch, and I honestly need you to understand. Do you understand that we're actually really significantly going against the grain of so much of what that is? Why would we want to be on that list? We don't do dramas here. We never have, not even when they were popular. We don't show movie clips during the sermon to engage your flesh somehow. We don't color coordinate the worship leaders and have, you know, choreograph when they turn and smile. It's not a show. That's not what's happening here. We don't play you know, our band certainly is very capable of playing any song you've ever heard in your life, but we don't do that to sort of, I just don't even understand some things that go on. We don't, there's no Ferris wheel or candy uh, being given to your children in this moment. There's, there might be a bit of candy. <laughs> God help us to always be like the Thessalonians. Look at these little parts here. Notice, first of all, they're receiving the word like a learner. Do you see it? When he says, we thank God constantly, this just wasn't a one-week thing, that when you received, you received the word of God that you heard from us. You received it. You got to know that I get to look at that all the time. I wish that you could see the the learning, the, the, the posture. You, you, you guys, you're, you don't, your eyes aren't going all over. You're, you're not sleeping. You're not looking around. Your, your, your posture, your facial expression, your, your open Bible, your pen in hand, all of this is saying learning, learning, learning. That's so awesome. I just really want to commend that and celebrate that, that that would only uh, continue and increase. Not, but notice, not only just the receiving of the word, but notice, accept it like a believer. There's actually two verbs here. Receive is letting it into your ears, and then accepting it is that after evaluating it, you decide about it favorably because you see it in the scriptures and you embrace it. Now, if I could just for a moment uh, do a little tutorial because I've noticed this, church family, come on. I've noticed this, that you guys know what to do when we're worshiping. You know, you, you lift your eyes or you close your eyes or you, you raise your hands or you raise your voice or you bow your head. You, you've picked up on many different ways to amplify and engage in worship. But do you, do you know, and, and I'll take the blame for the, my bad, okay? My bad that you don't, maybe, maybe don't know this, but do you know that when the word of God is read, there's things that we should be doing that we don't do it as well? Last week in church, I remember when they had those microphones set up and people come up and they, they line up, and I love that, and I love that you do that so willingly. And they come up and they read a verse of scripture, but do you know that while they're reading the verse of scripture, we don't know, we don't, seem to know what to do when that's happening. We're... Okay, so we're going to work on that right now, a little tutorial in church right now. So last week they gave you a list of verses as suggestions, and two of the verses that were read in every single service was Isaiah 40, 31, and Psalm 46, 1. So um, I'm going to 
act it out right now. And, and so here's your part. Ready? So we have three great words in Scripture that we can use, real great scriptural words that we hardly ever use. Um, the first one is a little more common, amen. When the word of God's being read, you can say amen. You can say amen. You can say amen. You can say any amening you want. You can go amen. You can say any amen you want. Amen means so be it. Or more in the vernacular, true that. All right? That's what it means. I mean, that's true right there. That thing he's saying, that's a true thing. All right? You can, so you can say amen. Um, you can say um, hallelujah. That means the Lord saves. And if a verse is being read that is comforting or, or assuring, if you can testify to the truthfulness of God's saving power in regard to the verse that's being read, you can say, come on, say it. You can say hallelujah. And then there's another one. Did you know this one? It's all through the Psalms. It's Selah. And Selah means, I got to think about that. I'm going to think about that. That needs some thinking. I haven't been thinking about that. I need to think about that. I'm going to think about that. But that would take a long time to say all that. So you just go, Selah. Think about it. All right, so ready? So I'm the guy, I'm, I'm you now, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be the person at the mic, and this is your practice. Ready? Oh, I'm so nervous. <laughs> <laughs> It's okay, we're glad you're up here. Uh, uh. Isaiah 40, 31. So if you, if you recognize the reference, you're already in. You, you want to start again? <laughs> Isaiah 40, 31. Those who, those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. See, I knew you had this in you. Okay, and this is going on all the campuses are doing right now. They're melting down in Niles right now. Okay? All right, now, come on. Now, next guy, girl. Here they come. Is it my turn? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, okay. <laughs> Psalm 46, 1. God is a refuge in strength. A very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Now, I can't guarantee it but I feel like there's a really good chance you're going to have an opportunity to put that into practice next week. <laughs> okay? I just have a feeling that could be coming. All right? So you're not going to disappoint, right? Why does this matter? 400,000 churches in America, and I guarantee you in most places, what's happening on the platform is the only life in the room. And your excellent participative nature that I have already tried to strongly affirm because it needs to be affirmed and you need to be encouraged about it. Part of that is now we're just taking it up another notch in worship, in the proclamation of the word, and now whenever the word is read, this, this what a life-giving, hope-giving, you don't know who's here this week, you don't know who's sitting here and wondering, this is another, phone it in, go through the motions, bunch of religious people, church, is this a church like that? No, it is not. And together we're doing something to make that really clear. So that's part of being a hopeful a community. Walk worthy of God's kingdom. Hear receptively God's word. The last phrase that I didn't refer to yet is when he says that you receive it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God. So a couple of points of clarification on that. Um, this is the idea, receive it like a learner, accept it like a believer, and then submit to it like an imitator. And the reason we submit to it is because it is the word of God. Now, this word, what do you mean, James, that this is the word of God? Here, here's what I mean. We don't believe in ex cathedra, okay? Ex cathedra is, is that there's a person and that every time their mouth is moving, God words are coming out of it. 
Just turn to your neighbor and say, we don't believe that. There's no person in our church, we don't believe in that there's one appointed person whose words are the words of God. We don't believe that. We also don't believe in something called infallibility. So that whoever the messenger is bringing the message at church today, we don't believe that there's an infallible messenger. We don't believe in ex-cathedral. We don't believe in infallibility. What we believe is we believe in sovereignty. And here's how that works. We believe that God has commanded the preaching of his word. And so because he has commanded it, we believe that our pastors or our preachers are under the authority of a plurality of elders and leaders in our church. And we believe that they have to account for every word that they say. And so our confidence is not placed in an individual person, but in a system to protect the church. Even then, we don't believe that the speaker is without error. We believe he may say something foolish, and, and, and he'll have to answer for that. What we believe is, is that because it's being offered from the scriptures, compared to the scriptures, shown from the scriptures, we believe that God is sovereignly overseeing that so that the experience of the hearer is that in and around and over and under that, God can speak to his church. That's what we believe. And so, um, by the way, that's, it's 500 years uh, this year since uh, the Reformation. And at the core of what they were protesting was this. They were protesting the idea that somehow the tradition of men could be exalted over the word of God. And they said it cannot be that way. Calvin, uh, on my left, Calvin said, God deigns to consecrate the tongues and mouths of men in order that his voice might resound in them. Luther uh, Luther said, predicatio verbum dei, a est verbum dei, which means that the preaching of the word of God is the word of God. That is God's word to his church. Let it be heard today. And let us be those people increasingly who walk worthy of the kingdom and hear receptively God's word, and finally, uh, imitate attentively God's family. Imitate. You see that there in the text? Which is at work in you. For you, brothers, became imitators of the church of God in Christ, churches of God in Christ that are in Judea. You, brothers, became imitators of this word of God. This idea of imitation is the idea of a mimic we became imitators of the churches in Judea, like attentive uh, copycats. Now, notice this. Not in any regard. The specific way that the Thessalonians, look at the text, the specific way that the Thessalonians were mimicking, copying, imitating the churches in Judea was in the area of suffering. For you suffered the same things from your countrymen as they did from the Jews. Just as the first churches suffered and the Thessalonians watched it and said, they didn't quit when it got hard. We're not going to quit when it gets hard. Fake Christians are strong when everything's prospering. Pseudo-Christians are fired up when life is fantastic. Note this. The truest proof of saving faith is a soaring faith during suffering. The truest proof of a saving faith is a soaring faith during suffering. Now, at the 9 o'clock service, I had a plant. I told a friend of mine, when I say that, and he yelled out from the back, Where's that in the Bible? Everyone freaked out, and the security guy ran over there and got crazy, so I thought, well, I won't do that again. <laughs> I'm always trying to keep you guys on your toes. The main thing I was just really trying to say is, it's not wrong for you to listen to something asserted and think to yourself, where's that in the Bible? I want you to do that, and I'll show you where what I just said is in the Scriptures. Matthew 24, 13, Jesus said, he who endures to the end 
will be saved. In Matthew 13, in the parable of the sower, um, the seed that fell on the rocky soil received the word with joy, but when persecution arose, it fell away. It just got too hard. I'm not, I'm not really in for that. And the whole book of Hebrews, a lady approached me after the 9 o'clock service and said, I need to see more scripture on that. So I was like, all right, well, then the whole book of Hebrews, but we won't take time to read that. Let me just read Hebrews 3, 12. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leaving you to fall away from the living God. Exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. 1 John 2.19 says, they went out from us because they were not of us. If they had been of us, they would have remained with us. That doesn't mean at a church. That means in faith. Defection is proof of false conversion. Perseverance is proof of genuine faith. And so here Paul is complimenting their genuine faith by saying to them, man, you guys, you imitated those churches, in those J Jerusalem churches, they all suffered. And you guys, when you accepted Christ, you suffered. Notice verse 15, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out and displeased God and oppose all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved. Wow. So as always to fill up the measure of their sins as Jesus predicted in Matthew 22, 23. But wrath has come upon them at last. So like I said, pretty challenging week and um, I don't have a lot of stories like this, but I had a real experience with the Lord this week. And thank you for praying for me. I, uh, about 2 a.m. on Friday night, or was it, I think it was Thursday night, actually. 2 a.m. on Thursday night, so Friday morning is what I was trying to say. I was in a deep, deep, you know what I'm talking about? Deep, deep, deep sleep. No knowledge of it, I wasn't dreaming, and nothing, nothing that I know of, nothing. And I heard, I can't say that it was audible, I don't feel the need to qualify that, I just know that I was in a deep sleep and I heard, break up the fallow ground of your heart, for it is time to seek the Lord until he comes and rains righteousness upon you. <laughs> and I was wide awake. And I know that that is what is said in Hosea 10, 12. And I got up so joyfully and for two and a half hours, I just said, Lord, I just want to seek you. I just want to have everything that you have for me, everything that you have for our family, everything that you have for our church. It was really pretty awesome. Now, when you hear that, do you feel in your heart to be skeptical? Do you feel in your heart to be cynical? Or do you feel in your heart to be hopeful? I'm not sure what that is exactly, Lord, but I'm just, I'm just thrilled that you're working in my pastor's heart and I just want you to be working in my heart too. I want to believe that the best days for me and for my family and for our church are still out in front of us and I'm just thankful that you're working in us and I'm thankful that you've called us and placed our feet upon a rock and we're believing you, God, for great things in the days ahead and we have hope together that you're still moving and you're still working. That's where I'm at. He has placed my feet upon a rock. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome? He's placed my feet upon a rock. Come on, say that. It's fun. Say it. He's placed my feet upon a rock. Come on, stand up. Say it like a preacher. Come on. Stand up. Say it. Say it. Wait, one, two, three. He's placed my feet upon a rock. I like you. You're gesturing. He's gesturing. Come on, preachers. Come on, preachers. Last time. Say it. He has placed my feet upon a rock. Amen.